Good morning and happy Sabbath. So good to be here this morning. Um, I think this is my second or third time at um, Troy Seventh Adventist Church. I, I was here um, when um, Pastor Israel Ramos got married. I think it was here, right? And then also when um, Pastor David Ashik was running AFCO, uh, we visited one time. And so this is my honor and privilege. Thank you so much for the invitation, for, for you to invite me and share a message. And also thank you for Pastor Conway. Um, can we sing one more song? Is it okay? Yeah. My wife, Abigail, can you come up and then um, play my favorite song? Can you turn your hymnal to number 298? 298. Um, I'll sing first verse. Um, I'll sing first verse and then maybe you can all join through all the way to the fifth verse. Number 298, I lay my sins on Jesus. I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed Lord, from the accursed Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we lay all our sins on Jesus Christ, the lame, 
to take away all the sins of the world. We gather here this morning because of your love and your grace. You have called out from this darkness, sin-tainted world to the marvelous light. We ask that you will fill our heart with your Holy Spirit, remove our stony hearts, and give us the heart of flesh. Wash us, cleanse us with your Son's precious blood this morning. We thank you, Lord. We pray all things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. The Bible says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stand watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is written in the book. Verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. How many of you enjoy watching sun sometime during the night? A few of you. You know, I don't know about the city in Detroit, but I live in a barren springs. It's a kind of countryside, and we have a beautiful star. Sometimes you can see even the, the Milky Way. The Bible says those who are wise or those who turn away many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Many people around the world, they dream to become a star. Whether it's a singer, it's a pop star, movie stars, Rock stars. Some time ago, they, when there was a survey done for the children, many of them, they said, I want to become athletes, famous athletes, so they could, you know, run fast or they play basketball well or football. But I, I don't know how many of our young people nowadays, including us, that we want to become a star in heaven when Jesus comes. And today I'm going to share with you how you could be the stars. There's some interesting facts about the stars. They said every star you see in the night sky is brighter and brighter than our sun. Can you imagine? And sometimes they said that the stars are like 5,000 5, times even bigger than the sun that we have here in solar system. You can only see about 2,000 stars on every dark night with the naked eyes from any given place of the Earth. To do this, you need to observe on a moonless light and be far away from screen, a source of the light pollution. There are approximately 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. Can you imagine? And I can, I can hardly wait when Jesus comes, that we can travel throughout this 200, with a billion, trillion stars. The last one, astronomers estim estimate there are trillion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. How many of you are familiar with, what is this? This is the latest space telescope. They, they launched last month. It's about the size of tennis court, okay? And the unique thing about this is it's not only just catching the visual light, but they also have infrared light. And this is an image they, they 
share. Before, it wasn't like this clear, but now we can see more and more clear stars and galaxies and Milky Ways in the universe. We think about Jesus, the second coming, when Jesus, when he was in earth, when he was taken up to the heaven. He says, I will come back soon, right? And that was how many years ago? Almost, almost 2,000 years ago. Then why, why are we still here after all? Have you wondered, like, you know, some of you, you are like third generation, fourth generation Adventist or Christians. You know, my, my great uncle, when he was 19 years old, he was a senior high school, um, walking by this church and saw this name, Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was, by the way, him and his family, they were Methodists. And when they saw this long name, he was curious, what is, what is Seventh-day Adventist? So he went in and then met the pastor. He's like, well, what do you believe? And then he had a Bible study. After two weeks, he got baptized. And then, and then the, he invited his, this pastor to his family, his father and mother, and then all his siblings. And then they had another two weeks of ba- Bible study. And then the whole family became Seventh-day Adventist. That was back in 1950s. My grandparents, they believe with all their heart that Jesus will come back soon because they grew up riding horses. Imagine, early 1900s, I don't know about the United States, but Korea, we didn't have like, a, you know, technology. Everybody was riding horses and, and, and cows and things like that. And then soon they saw train. And then cars. And then when they become, I think, 70 years old, their, one of their sons invited them to the U.S. They flew America. They were fascinated by this airplane. Can you imagine from horse to airplane? And they see all the signs and wonders say, Jesus will come back soon. And that was what we heard growing up. And then they become 90s. And then one by one, they passed away. And then we wonder how long we have to wait. My uncle, who we visited two months ago, he's in 90s now. After 70 years, he's been teaching at the seminary as a professor. Jesus is coming soon. And now he has a dementia. He's like saying things again and again. I'm like, uncle, how long do we have to wait? You know, you could, you could, you could tell there's enough signs and wonder. Today, you just turn the TV on for five minutes. There are all the signs that Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 is there. The rumors of the war, natural disasters all around the world. Last week, I mean this week, there was a flood in Pakistan. Thousands of people perished just like that overnight. Earthquakes. The war in Ukraine, war in Myanmar. We don't, we don't, we have no idea what's happening except for just glimpse from the news. People are running away to jungle in Myanmar to survive. The Christians persecuted by the Buddhists. They're burning down their houses and taking over their territories. We don't know how much God had shown us that His coming is near. So why then? Why? We're still here today, 2022. This is already September 3rd. Can you imagine? You know, I, I still sometimes write 2021 when I write a check because, you know, I get used to 2021, but now it's already September. We only have a four months to go. And then there goes 2022. How long are we going to be here? How long? How many souls have to be perished and witness our children and sometimes we think like, okay, we're going to have a children growing up. They will attend the Adventist church. And then maybe Andrews or Southern. And then they're going to find their, their spouse. And we're going to go to their wedding. And we're going to have a grandchildren. And we're going to have... Are we, are, we, are we thinking about that? 
Or are we thinking about, we'll be in heaven with our children, praising God with thousands and thousands of angels together. How can we hasten Jesus' coming? Is that our life every day? What is it? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Here's the first reason that Jesus cannot come back. Have mercy. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, promise of His coming, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. Jesus is not delaying his coming because he's not ready. Jesus is not coming today because, because the, the mansion that he promised is not completed yet. The reason he cannot come back is because of what? We have not experienced true repentance. You know, we're not talking about repentance like, Dear Lord, please forgive my sin that I committed all day throughout today. Give us good night rest. Amen. Is that, is that repentance? No. We're not talking about like childish. We need to search our heart. Matter of fact, we are living in a time of what? Probation. Am I right? As a Seventh-day Adventist, we know since 1844, October 22nd, we're in a time that we're supposed to experience the Day of Atonement, right? What, what happens during the time? We afflict our souls, search our life, and see if there's anything that has not been confessed before the Lord. That experience is needed now, because if Jesus comes tonight, are you ready to welcome him with open arms and say, Lord, I've been waiting for you all this time? Or are you going to say to the rocks and to the mountain, fall on me because I have not thoroughly repented my sins? When Jesus leaves the most holy place, brothers and sisters, as a high priest pleading for our sins, if he leaves the heavenly sanctuary, there's no forgiveness. I'm sorry. And nobody knows when that will happen. Am I right? He will not say, okay, 2023, October or something. He's not going to announce that to Nobody will know. Every day, it's going to be like one of those days that we just spend. The righteous will be righteous. The unrighteous will be all forever unrighteous. We need to search our heart right now and say, Lord, is there anything that I have not confessed? You know, there's some sins that we don't even remember because it's been so long ago. We need to ask God, Lord, is there anything that I don't remember right now? Can you please remind me so I can ask for your forgiveness when Jesus is still there at the most holy place? When this will take place, the church will turn upside down. Not from, I mean, it's not going to happen from like whole church, a whole Michigan conference, whole North America division, it starts from me and you. Jesus is waiting for that experience to be happening right now. That's why he's delaying. If he comes right now, maybe some of us, we're not ready to meet Jesus Christ.
Here is an inspired writing. It says, Repentance includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness until we turn away from it in heart. There will be no real change in the life. That's why we need to think of Jesus Christ on the cross every day because of our sins, because of our disobedience. He had to die on the cross as a Lamb of God. And we are so grateful for His sacrifice. Amen? Amen. Because of death and resurrection, we have hope for eternal life. We don't have to die as a sinner. But God has given us a new life and hope that we could be like Him. Let's turn our Bible to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, reading from verse 6 and 7. Here is the experience that God wants His church to experience in the last days. You know, Isaiah chapter 58 is talking about the God's people must experience through the time of day of atonement. And sometimes people think, in the beginning of the chapter, it says people like, why is God not hearing our voice? We confess, we repent, but why is He not hearing us and answering to our prayers? And here's answers. What kind of fast and experience God wants? Is this not the fast that I have chosen to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hid yourself from your own flesh? This is the experience that God wants us to have as a part of their atonement experience. Yes, we need to search our heart. But when we search our heart and understand the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, instead of us thinking about me, 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 we start looking around and say, how can I share this beautiful love that God shared with me? How can I bless other people that how God has blessed me today? And we will turn to our neighbors those who are in need, we will minister to them. That is the life of Jesus that we need to have right now. In Matthew chapter 25, has parables. And the, each parable has specific message for the Christians in the last days. Again, who are waiting for the second coming of Christ. Starting with the wise and unwise virgins, right? They're all waiting for the bridegrooms to come. But the five who prepare the oil, the only ones, welcome the wedding party. But the unwise, they could not. It's talking about the Christians. They're talking about those who are waiting for a second coming. And then the last parable has two groups of people. They both say, oh, they're Christians. They've been coming to church for many, many years. They've been faithfully giving, returning the offerings and tithe. And here he says, in the right, the king says, then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Verse 27, then the, uh, 37, then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did you, we see you na- uh, sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. In land like Cambodia, a family makes about two or three dollars and survive. We are here. I mean, we, we feel the, the inflation, right? Or recession right now. And, you know, gas, pumping gas every, every day is like, whoa. I mean, glad, uh, praise God, the price has, you know, lowered from close to $5 and then now to three something. But people like in Laos here, their salary, the value of their salary became like 50% overnight. You know, we are, America is a strong country. The dollar is really strong compared to other currency. And so things change. And, and, and I, I talked to my friend in La- Laos a few days ago. And they said, yeah, our currency the value goes 50% less from the other week. And they have to survive. Everything, the price is doubled now, and they have to survive. We see many poor countries suffering this, during this difficult time. And God is saying, what can we do to help? When we went to Cambodia back in 2016, we've been t- working with Cambodian people for many years, number of years. So we thought, okay, we're going to go there. The general conference will build, you know, nice center of influence, almost like million dollar project. And then we're going to run this and that. And, and, and praise the Lord, the, the project finished while we were there. Um, and we have all this beautiful building. And we had a grand opening in 2019. And then everything seems everything like good and right, and then <laughs> pandemic hits. The Cambodia government says shut down every institution and churches, religious temples closed down. What do you do when everything is closed? We pray, Lord, what do you want us to do? We cannot operate clinic, we cannot operate language school, we cannot operate music school, we cannot operate restaurant because everything is closed. And God impressed us to pray for the poor. And we start feeding children. You know, Cambodia, rice is kind of plenty. But like fruits, vegetables, is only for the wealthy people. They survive with, literally, they'll have a bowl of rice. They'll have a ramen noodle seasoning. And they sprinkle over the rice and then they, they'll eat. If they have a little more money, they will go to the market and buy dry fish. And then eat with the rice. That's the, most of the Cambodians survive with. So having meals like rice and fruits... And, and some of the bread, soy milk, it's, it's a fancy meal for them. The amazing thing is that when we start praying, God starts sending, impressing people's heart, and then sending donation to us. So we end up feeding 280 children every time we serve them in, in Badabong City. That is not what what we thought about when we were heading towards Cambodia. It was all by God's way of putting together. And and we were running Sabbath school, branch Sabbath school all for these children. And they're learning about God. 
before they were rejecting, you know, they, when we invite them to come to church, they would never come to church. But when pandemic hit and they had no means of sort of supporting themselves and, and, and they're desperate, the schools are closed, all the children running all over the place. And when we show them the Bible and teach them about Jesus, they were listening. They were coming to learn about Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are, I believe, in America, it's like modern-day Canaan. We have so much milk and honey in this land. You know, you go, I mean, like, when, when we travel back to the United States every time from Cambodia, the first, like, culture shock is Walmart. You know, we have all this, not, not all just this milk, type of milk. We have all kind of soy milk, almond milk, cashew milk, oat milk, rice milk. I mean, for the vegetarians, this is heaven. <laughs> we are so blessed, but yet we don't think about what's happening the other side of the globe what people are going through every day to survive. And there are many of them. They have no idea about Jesus Christ. What are you going to say? When did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we go and visit you in the prison? It, it is not, of course, we cannot save ourselves by doing these things. It has to be from love of God that we experience every day. If you see Jesus Christ on the cross, then we fill our hearts with His love. Then we will go out and share, God loved me. He saved my life. I am free from guilt and sin. I want to share this wonderful blessing with you. How can I help you? How can I bless you today? Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. You probably know this by heart. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The second reason why Jesus has been delaying. The Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached all the world as a witness to all the nation, and then the end will come. First reason, he's delaying because you and I, we're not ready. We have not truly experienced the repentance, searching our hearts, afflicting our souls. The second reason Jesus cannot come because there are so many people around the world, they have no idea who Jesus is. And they're waiting. They're waiting to hear somebody who come, please come and tell me about who Jesus is and what he had done in my, in, in, to, to us. When? When is it going to be happen? You know, I look at the um, website called Joshua Project. I don't know if you can see it. Out of 7. Point, I think it's 9 billion people, almost 42.3 percent of population, they don't know who Jesus is. D did you hear that? Almost 42.3% they're unreached people. And we're wondering, why is Jesus not coming back? When we were in Cambodia, I told you, we have a million-dollar building, beautiful facilities. I mean, one of the best buildings in the whole city of Batambong. You know what was the number one issue over there? It's not about operating budget. We have a, enough funding to run it by general conference and then division. But the number one problem that we had is we do not have enough people to work. We have no teacher to teach. We have nobody to come and teach how to make healthy meals. 
We have no doctor and nurses willing to come and see the patients. We announce the worldwide church, please come and help. At the beginning, maybe a few people, thousand missionary movements and their, their young people for 10 months and then go. Come and go. Even now, they had a, they had a beautiful fitness club with, with, with thousands of dollars worth of equipment. They're there collecting the dust because the fitness club, the coach, he was volunteer for three months and he left with his wife. Now everything stopped because nobody is willing to go and share the gospel. I mean, of course, we're not going to just go around door to door for this Buddhist country asking them to come to church. We have to find a way to reach out to them. What is their need? Are they interested in learning music? Or are they interested in learning English or Korean or Chinese? Are they, or do they have a health issue, that, but, but they have no money? Come to our center. We have a free clinic. But somebody has to meet them and help their needs and then share about Jesus Christ. Have you heard about Jesus that I believe? He saved my life. I was a different person in the back then. But now I meet Jesus. I feel so happy. And I want to share this with you. I shared the message, similar message to a church. Wonderful. I met this wonderful couple, Adventists. They've been, they've been in church for many years. We are so appreciating your message. I hear you. So I ask, can you send your children? Well, they, they have to go to school and they have to prepare for the MCAT and DAT. Maybe when they are done with their exam and then when they get their license and then they practice a little bit, maybe we can. Why are we here? Do we really want Jesus to come back? Or are we just like, one day somebody will go to Cambodia or somebody will go to Papua New Guinea or somebody will go to Nepal and India to share gospel and then... And then Jesus might come back in my lifetime, lifetime, or, or maybe, maybe my children's time. Is it the attitude that we have right now? Yes. As a father, I want to see my children growing up. But the every day, that when I see my children witnessing sins and its effect, it's painful for me. Lord, how long they have to witness these things? How long they have to see and observe what evil could do to our human beings? Do you want your grandchildren and do you want your great-grandchildren to experience that? You know, he actually what? Ellen Jawan says it was a blessing for Adam to die at 930 years after all this time. Can you imagine living 10 centuries? And it was a blessing for him to die because he was sick and tired of witnessing all these evil things done because of his fall. How long do you want to continue this kind of life, brothers and sisters? Unless something must happen now, Jesus cannot return. He cannot. Are you waiting for general conference to recruit more missionaries to come? I'll share you some stories, okay? We don't have time here. There's testimony to the churches, volume 6, page 23. Our efforts in missionary lines must become far more extensive a more dedicated work than has been done must be done prior to the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, when was this written? More than 100 years ago. Am I right? 
And why die 2000, I mean, 1915? Now we're living in 2022. So this is, must have been written more than 100 years ago. And this is what she said. We need more people to be interested in foreign work before Jesus comes. God's people are not to seize their labors until they shall encircle the world. Another one, page 27. The whole missionary work will be further advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificed spirit is manifested for the proper, uh, prosperity of foreign mission. For the prosperity of the home work depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the ev uh, evangelical works done in countries afar off. Do you want this church to grow? Do, do, you want, do you really want this church to grow? It says, do the foreign work. Invest it and support the missionary works. The missionary spirit is to be cherished. The message of mercy is to be given to those that have not heard it. By many, this message will be received. They will reflect to other, others the light and truth that has been graciously bestowed on them. Thus, the church may enjoy the reflect influence of extending the work to the region beyond. Do you hear about this story? L Luther Warren and Harry Fenner. Luther Warren, I, I look it up. This is the, these two young people, by the way, Luke, I think Luther was 14 years old, and then Henry, 17 years old. They were Seventh-day Adventist young people. They were walking one day, they said, brother, we must do something to hasten Jesus' is coming. What can we do? Can we have a youth meetings, missionary club, something like that, like Boy Scouts, so we can help other young people to get involved with missionary work. So in 1879, they start Missionary Volunteer Society. This is the beginning of Adventist youth movement, brothers and sisters. Started by young people, 14 years old and 17 years old. And guess what happened to their movement? These guys, they start 1907 by then. Missionary volunteers, young people, they started convention. More than 100 uh, delegates were elected. They held meetings, studied the Bible, and engaged in missionary work. And they were doing all this outreach singing, scripture study, seasonal prayer, or personal testimonies, daily devotion, giving Bible studies, and giving out literatures. This is a foundation of pathfinders, too. But somehow we lost the track. What was the beginning of this movement? It was about how can we become God's missionaries? Our schools are all named Emmanuel Missionary College, Southern Missionary College. You know, in Asia, in Thailand, they used to have a mission college, but now we change their names. Andrews University, Southern Adventist Universities, Asia International Pacific Universities. There's no, not even Adventist there anymore. And people become what? They're so hungry for how can we make more money instead of becoming missionaries. Young people, when they meet together to study the Bible and sharing the gospel and then do literature work and then prayer meeting and sharing testimonies, there's some young people say, I want to join that movement. I want to become a missionary. And guess what? 1910, Pastor Howard Lee joined as a missionary. 
he graduated Emmanuel College, and then he got married, and he said, I want to go. So General Conference sent him to Korea. He was 30 years old when he came to South Korea. Actually, at that time, it was a, both Korea, South, North and Korea, South Korea. And then they start training school. I told you, right? Back then, there was no cars, no horse. So they have to travel from here by ship all the way to Japan, Gobe, and then from there to Busan, and from there, travel, 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 many weeks to Pyongyang. Right now, actually, is the capital city of North Korea. And that they're using that, that same area, the way they used to have a training school as an airport, Sunan uh, International Airport right now, right now. Anyway, so they start training schools. And then a few years later, the children born. And then daughter died. But he did not stop. He buried the daughter next to the, 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 the school and then continued to work. For 30 some years, he came back. His son continued serving another 30 years in Korea. Many of the missionaries that during the time, they have no plan or like benefit or anything like that, like nowadays as a missionaries. They travel months to go to the mission field. They have a, you know, the letter takes about a month and a half, two, two months to get to America from Korea. They work and work and work with faith. Many of the missionaries, you'll see it here. You know the bottom picture here? Almost half of the people, they died because of illness in the mission field. But amazing thing is, they did not left the mission field. They stayed, continued sharing the gospel, training pastors and teachers. One of them, I mean, William Robert Smith. He's a medical missionary. After Howard Lee got there, he requests General Conference, please send medical missionary to Korea. And they sent him. Again, one of his child died, but he continued building the medical hospital there. Mimi Schaffenberg. She got cold when she was 23, I believe. 1906, she was a missionary to Korea. She was a teacher. She was a dean, the girls' dormitory, focused on training and educating women by engaging Bible, Bible institutes for, for, for women, uh, editor for the Shijo, the Korean Adventist Review magazine, Superintendent for the Sabbath School in Seoul, mission there. Translate the books on Daniel and Revelation, Patriarchs and Prophets, and the Bible reading to Korean language. When she died, she died because of illness. She came back to the United States. This is what they said about her. In those times, few missionaries had been sent overseas. There was no provision made for an outfitting allowance. No homes had been built for them in their new locations. No definite plans had been laid for language study, nor had furlough policies been established. And there were no experienced missionaries to befriend the new recruit upon her arrival in, in strange land. Today, the general conference would uh, hesitate to send a young, young girl of only 23 to an, an outpost mission sta station. And who can know the house of illnesses, the difficulties of language study, and of becoming acclimated to the strange sounding that Mimi experienced? Sister Schaffenberg has done much for the work in Chosen, the old Korea. And in her death, we have lost a loyal and unselfish worker. And the Korean people have lost a kind friend and helper. The news of her death brought sadness to our midst. 
But with that sadness was a determination to press forward and quickly finish the work she has dearly loved. Now we have a Korean Union Conference. 698 churches, 260,000 members as of last year. Two universities, two, seven academies, 12 SDA language institute, and then some new food company because of missionaries and their sacrifice. 260,000 people in Korea without the sacrifice of missionaries. We would not have this gospel in our country. The question is, how many of you are willing to go or support missionary work? Depends on this very issue. We could hasten Jesus' coming or delay His coming. My appeal to you this morning I know you have a job, you have, to fa- you have family to support. Some of you are still students. You're still um, going through the education. How many of you are willing to either go or support the missionaries? Somebody says, if you're not a missionary, you are all mission field. What are you? Are you a mission field or are you a missionary? You don't have to go to Cambodia or you don't have to go to Papua New Guinea. You don't have to go to Iraq or Iran to share the gospel. But you can still be a missionary supporting financially or praying for them every day. But we cannot just sit down and do nothing. If we truly believe and want Jesus to come back soon, does it make sense to you? If we just continue living in this, this good life in America, hoping that one day somebody will go and share the gospel, Jesus cannot return. 42% of people unreached, still waiting for somebody to come and share gospel to them. Who's going to be that person? You know, I I remember, I don't know how many of you remember Abraham Raru. He gets so excited about missionary work at the age of 60. So he applied, I want to go and share the gospel. General Conference says, no. You're too old. We'll send you to Hawaii. Enjoy the paradise. So he went to Hawaii. Few years he served, like, I cannot stay there. He quit. He bought his own ticket to Hong Kong, Shanghai, and the missionary to China. First Adventist unpaid missionary at the age of 60. Can you imagine? Many of you are still young. I'm not saying that quit your job and then go to mission field. Have mercy. No. But I want you to pray about it. If you can join the short-term missionary, try from there. But you, we have to do something to finish the work that the 12 disciples started. Actually, Jesus started first. We must finish. The whole universe is waiting for the last race. You know the relay? People have been running, starting from Abraham or Adam and Eve, and then to their children and Noah, and then Abraham and Isaac, Jake, and then Moses, and then to Joshua. People are running, racing with all their might. And then to prophets, Elijah, to Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were all running. 
and then give it to Jesus, and then to 12 disciples, and then all these people running with this gospel. Even the dark age kept running with all the persecution in the mountains and the wilderness. They ran and ran and ran. And then William Miller picked it up and then gave it to the Advent movement. And then that baton has been give it to, given to us. And then we're the last racer. The whole universe is watching to finish the race. How many of you today want to see Jesus Christ soon? And say, Lord, I will do my best. I will do my best with all my effort to share the gospel to my neighbors, my friends, my workers, co-workers, my friends at school. And be a missionary to Detroit, to Michigan, to America, and to oversee. I really want to see some of your church members here today would go to mission field. That the Troy Adventist Church can officially send the missionary to the overseas and sponsor their own members. Is it your desire today? Are you willing to say, Lord, I am a humble person. I'm not this and that, but if you can use me, please use me for your work. If that is your desire today, I want you to raise your hand. Please. Okay. My final appeal. Today you heard the message. Why Jesus has been relay, re delaying His coming. The scripture says, those who lead many to righteous, righteousness will be the stars like a star forever and ever. I don't know how many of you know BTS, the famous singing group in Korea. I look it up and they make about $170 million every year. That's a lot of money, right? But soon, their fame will be gone. And they will look for another idols. We have many young people. I praise the Lord that we have many young people here at the church. I want to ask young people, how many of you are willing to say, Lord, I want to serve you? Whether I become nurse, I become teacher or doctor, or I become factory workers, I don't know. But I will be your missionary today and surrender my life because I want Jesus to come back soon. I want to ask that question to young people today. How many of you say, Lord, I will serve you when I grow up. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up and say, Lord, I want to serve you as a missionary. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Conway, can you come up and pray for these young people and the church members that their heart will be sealed and they will be used as a missionary to the Lord. Let's pray together. Loving Father, I want to thank you for the words of the message that have been spoken to us on this day, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to recommit ourselves and commit ourselves to the spread of the gospel, which is really the spread of your love and your character and your desire to save every member of the human family. Amen. I especially want to lift up these young men and young women 
who have stood to their feet in answer to the call to be missionaries. We are told that everyone who is born into the kingdom of God is born a missionary. Lord, it is a solemn reality that you have called every one of us and are calling every one of us to come to you. This is the first call that we must answer. And then you call us to engage in service for you. These young men and young women have stood to their feet saying they want to engage in service for you. But I don't want it to be lost that it also means that they are willing to surrender their lives to you. Lord, this, this planet is filled with distractions and Satan has been practicing for thousands of years. I pray a hedge around each one of these young men and young women that this decision might not be lost in the fog of everyday life. That the tug on their heartstrings and the desire to see Jesus come and the desire to engage in service, sharing the gospel and helping humanity would not be lost sight of in the pursuit of things. Accomplishments and status that is only significant in this world. Lord, I'm not praying that our children would not strive for excellence. I'm praying that they would strive for excellence. I'm praying that they would be successful in this life, but also in the life to come. Amen. I'm praying that they would be ambitious for the master's glory. Amen. I'm praying that the words of Holy Scripture might be etched in their hearts and in their minds, them that honor me, I will honor. And whether it's in their schooling or in their places of employment, or when the time comes to make a decision Father, what would you have me to do? I pray that they might always seek to honor you. And I pray that you would give their parents, their grandparents, their uncles, their aunties, give us the wisdom to know when you are calling them. Help us to give them counsel that is in harmony with your will for their lives. Mm -hmm. May our prayers be in harmony with your will for their lives. May the things that we do and we say and the choices that we make for them be in harmony with your will for their lives. And may this be a church, as Pastor Shin has suggested, a church that supports and encourages young men and young women, old men and old women to be missionaries for you. Thank you for hearing and answering our humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. God bless you and be with you.